The hoofs drew nearer. They had no time to find any hiding place better than the general darkness under the trees. Sam and Pippin crouched behind a large tree bowl while Frodo crept back a few yards towards the lane. It showed grey and pale, a line of fading light through the woods. Above it the stars were thick in the dim sky, but there was no moon. The sound of hoofs stopped. As Frodo watched, he saw something dark pass across the lighter space between two trees and then halt. It looked like the black shade of a horse led by a smaller black shadow. The black shadow stood close to the point where they had left the path and it swayed from side to side. Frodo thought he heard the sound of snuffling. The shadow bent to the ground and then began to crawl towards him. These words are from the first book in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the most popular book of the 20th century. But did you know these books are Catholic? Hello. I'm Joseph Pierce, and I'll be your guide as we explore the Catholicism of the Lord of the Rings. The Lord of the Rings, the most popular book of the 20th century and one of the greatest books ever written, is a Catholic work full to the brim with the truths of the Gospel. And there's no need to take my word for it. Here are the words of the author himself. The Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. Unconsciously so at first, but consciously in the revision. So there we have it, from the lips of J.R.R. Tolkien, the author himself, in words written to his Jesuit friend, Father Robert Murray, in 1953. But how is it fundamentally religious and Catholic? There's no mention of Christ or his church anywhere in the book. Not least because the story takes place thousands of years before Christ revealed himself in the person of Jesus. How can it be Catholic if there's no mention of Christ or Catholicism? This is the question that will be answered over the next hour as we explore the Catholicism of the Lord of the Rings. First, however, let's learn a little more about Tolkien himself. He was born in Bloemfontein in South Africa on the 3rd of January 1892 and was baptised four weeks later in the local Anglican Cathedral. Both his parents were English and the family were living in South Africa because of his father's position as manager of the Bloemfontein branch of the Bank of Africa. Shortly after Tolkien's third birthday, his mother returned to England, taking Tolkien and his younger brother Hilary with her. His father, unable to vacate his post at the bank, was forced to remain behind, intending to follow his wife and children to England as soon as the opportunity arose. But tragedy struck the young family. Arthur Tolkien contracted rheumatic fever and died in Africa.
The death of her husband plunged Mabel Tolkien into poverty. With two young sons, she relied on financial assistance from her family. Then in 1900, when Tolkien was eight years old, Mabel Tolkien was received into the Catholic Church. Furthermore, she began to instruct her sons in the Catholic religion and they were duly received into the church also. Her family reacted with fury to her conversion, withdrawing the financial assistance and plunging her and her sons from poverty to penury. The strain affected her health adversely and Tolkien was convinced that his mother's early death in 1904, when he was only 12 years old, was due to the persecution she experienced following her conversion to Catholicism. My own dear mother was a martyr indeed, and it was not to everybody that God grants so easy a way to his great gifts as he did to Hilary and myself, giving us a mother who killed herself with labor and trouble to ensure us keeping the faith. On another occasion, when confronted with the prospect of some of his own children's neglect of their faith, Tolkien remembered his mother's sanctity and loyalty to the faith. When I think of my mother's death, worn out with persecution, poverty, and largely consequent disease, in the effort to hand on to us small boys the faith, and remember the tiny bedroom she shared with us in rented rooms in a postman's cottage in Rednall, where she died alone, too ill for viaticum. I find it very hard and bitter when my children turn away. After their mother's death, Father Francis Morgan of the Birmingham Oratory became the legal guardian of Tolkien and his brother. Tolkien would describe Father Morgan as a guardian who had been a father to me, more than most real fathers. Tolkien went on to study classics at Oxford, receiving his degree in 1915, before enlisting in the army. In the following year, he married his childhood sweetheart, Edith Bratt, and two months afterwards, he sailed to France to take part in what he described as the animal horror and carnage of the Battle of the Somme, one of the most horrific battles in human history. It was also around this time that he began to invent the first of his Elvish languages, a hobby that would become the creative passion of his life, leading eventually to the publication of his masterpiece. John, the first of the four Tolkien children, who would later become a Jesuit priest, was born in 1917. Their second son, Michael, followed in 1920, Christopher in 1924, and Priscilla, their only daughter and final child, was born in 1929. It was during this period that Tolkien, who was now teaching at Oxford University, first met C.S. Lewis. The two men were destined to form the most important literary friendship of the 20th century, in spite of their differences when they first met. Tolkien was a devout Catholic, whereas Lewis, born in the sectarian atmosphere of Protestant Belfast in Northern Ireland, had been taught from childhood not to trust papists, to employ the derogatory term with which Ulster Protestants expressed their contempt for their Catholic neighbours. On my first coming into the world, I had been implicitly warned never to trust the papist, and at my first coming to the English faculty, explicitly never to trust a philologist. Tolkien was both. It would seem, therefore, that a friendship between Tolkien and Lewis was not very likely. What brought them together was a shared love for mythology, and particularly, a love for Norse mythology. They became good friends after Lewis joined an informal club that had been founded by Tolkien with the single purpose of reading the Norse myths 
in their original language. Lewis had long since lapsed from his childhood Protestantism and had become an atheist. And yet in September 1931, a long conversation between Tolkien and Lewis on the subject of myth would be instrumental in Lewis's conversion to Christianity. It all began when Lewis provoked Tolkien by indicating that myths were lies. Including in fairy stories, which I think is rather ridiculous. After all, the magic of myths or fairy stories is not an end in itself. It exists to serve virtue and satisfy certain primordial human desires. But myths are fiction. The stories they tell aren't true. They're lies and therefore worthless, even though breathed through silver. They're just beautiful lies. You, you can't seriously believe in fairy tales. Why not? I can, in fact, I do. <laughs> but this is preposterous. How can you seriously believe a lie? Oh, Jack, myths are not lies. In fact, they're the very opposite of a lie. Myths convey the essential truth, the primal reality of life itself. Go on. Well, you see, we have been duped into using the word myth as being synonymous with a lie because we have been duped into accepting the first real lie of materialism. And what is that? That is the hideous claim that there is no supernatural order to the universe. The materialists have imprisoned us in a world of mere matter, of, of physical facts divorced from and devoid of metaphysical truth. Well, I say that they are lying. I say that they are the ones who have come up with a false myth. Their world doesn't exist. It's merely a figment of their imagination. Well, fine. However, there's a problem. The problem is they have convinced us that it is true. They have made us believe that this is all there is. Three dimensions, five senses, four walls. Isn't it? Most emphatically not. Jack, the four walls of materialism are the four walls of a prison, and the materialists are our jailers. Don't you see? They've put us in a prison, a prison of four walls. They don't want us to see what's beyond those walls. They don't want us to discover what, what lies outside their narrow philosophy. Worse than that, they think that any attempt to escape from the prison is an act of treason. Well, wouldn't it be an act of treason against rationality to believe otherwise? Now, Jack, think for a moment. How can it be wrong for a prisoner to think of things that exist other than walls or jailers? Doesn't the fact that the prisoner is able to, to think of things outside the walls suggest that perhaps things do exist outside the walls? After all, if the prison really is all there is, how are we able to picture things that exist beyond the prison? And this is where myths come in, you see. Myths exist outside the prison. Myths allow us to escape from the prison. Or if we are not able to escape, at the very least, they allow us to catch a, a fleeting but oh so powerful glimpse of the beauty that lies beyond the walls. But what is it that we're meant to be glimpsing? Well, don't you see the truth, Jack? Myths show us a fleeting glimpse of truth itself. Truth. Truth. What on earth is this truth that you're talking about? Ah. Quid est veritas? What is truth? I'm glad to see that you've entered into the spirit of the myth, Jack. You've just cast yourself into the role of Pilate. Pilate? <laughs> oh, I see. You're able to believe in the lesser myths because you've already accepted the big one. Once you accept the big myth, the lie of Christ, it's easy to accept the smaller ones. All right, Tolas, I'll play the role of Pilate. I wash my hands of the whole nonsense. Well, Jack, you may be able to wash your hands, but your mind is still muddied. 
You're not thinking clearly at all, old chap. You're acting as if myths are mere arbitrary inventions of fiction, as if we pull them out of thin air. But what you don't understand is that we make things by the law in which we are made. We create because we are created. Creativity, imagination, is God's imageness in us. We tell stories because God is a storyteller. In fact, he is the storyteller. We tell our stories with words. He tells his story with history. The facts of history are his words, and providence is his storyline. Are you suggesting that all of history, that everything around us is all part of some divine myth? We are all part of his story. This very conversation is part of his story. But perhaps it isn't his story, perhaps it's only your story. How can you know that your story the story that you believe, the Christian story, is any more real than the other story. Oh, but don't you see, it isn't my story, it's his story. You're acting as if Christianity is one myth among many. It's not, it's the true myth. Christianity really happened. Jesus really existed, so did Pilate. And yet it is this true story that makes sense of all the other stories. It is the archetype. It is the story in which all the other stories have their source. And the story to which all the other stories point. It has everything. It has catastrophe and its opposite, what we might call you catastrophe. It has the joy of the happy ending, the sudden joyous turn in the story that is essential to all myths. It has to a sublime degree this, this joy of deliverance, this, this evangelium, this fleeting glimpse of the real joy to which all other joys are but a distant echo. Tolas, what did you mean by catastrophe and you catastrophe? Well, for example, it has the catastrophe of the fall and the you catastrophe of the uh, redemption. It has the catastrophe of the crucifixion and the you catastrophe of the resurrection. It has everything man's heart desires because it is being told by the one who is the fulfillment of desire itself. It is a story that begins and ends in joy. But just because a story brings joy, it doesn't necessarily follow that it's true. There are many joyful myths. They all seem rather flimsy to me and ring rather false. And yet this story has the inner consistency of reality. There is no tale ever told that men would rather find was true and none which so many skeptical men have accepted as true on its own merits. Perhaps it's just a very well-written artifice. This story has the supremely convincing tone of primary art, not fiction, but of creation. And to reject this leads either to darkness or to wrath. And in my own life, it has led me from darkness to light. Astonishing. Told us you astonish me. You absolutely astonish me. This conversation made such an impact on C.S. Lewis that within a few weeks he was declaring to his friends that he had become a Christian. You may not believe this, but I've definitely started to believe in Christ, in Christianity. And the long talk with Tolkien had a great deal to do with it last week. Let me try to explain. The story of Christ is a true myth, a myth working on us in the same way as the others, but with this tremendous difference that it rarely happened. 
and one must be content to accept it in the same way, remembering that this is God's myth, where the other myths are men's myths. Which is to say that the pagan stories are God expressing himself through the minds of poets, using such images as he found there, while Christianity is God expressing himself through what we call real things. It is therefore true, not in the sense of being a description of God, which no finite mind could take in, but in the sense of being the way in which God chooses to appear to our faculties. And so we see how Tolkien was instrumental in the conversion of C.S. Lewis. Isn't it astonishing to think that we don't only have Tolkien to thank for the brilliance of The Lord of the Rings, but that we also have him to thank, indirectly, for the Chronicles of Narnia and all of Lewis's other wonderful works of Christian literature. And speaking personally, I still remember my own first reading of The Lord of the Rings and what a profoundly healthy effect it had upon me. At the time, I was a long way from any belief in Christianity and could not even envisage my own future conversion to Catholicism. Looking back, my journeying with Frodo into Middle-earth helped me to understand the true nature of heroism and to see that it is really the same thing as sanctity. Tolkien was one of the first people to show me the reality of holiness and to enkindle within me a desire for holiness myself. Like C.S. Lewis, I owe a great debt of gratitude to J.R.R. Tolkien. It is now time that we turn our attention to the Catholicism of the Lord of the Rings itself. We will remember that Tolkien stated emphatically that the Lord of the Rings is a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. And on another occasion, he spoke of a scale of significance with regard to his relationship as the author, with the Lord of the Rings as his work. At the bottom of the scale were what he called insignificant facts, which were irrelevant. Then there were more significant facts, such as his academic vocation as a philologist at Oxford University, which had affected his taste in languages and which was therefore, obviously, a large ingredient in the Lord of the Rings. Yet even this was subservient to the most important factors. And there are a few basic facts which, however dryly expressed, are surely significant. For instance, I was born in 1892 and lived for my early years in the Shire, in a pre-mechanical age. Or, more important, I am a Christian, which can be deduced from my stories, and in fact, a Roman Catholic. According to Tolkien himself, the fact that he is a Christian, which can be deduced from his stories, and in fact a Roman Catholic, was the more important of the really significant factors at the very top of the scale of significance relating to his relationship as author to The Lord of the Rings. Since this is so, we should not be surprised to discover that The Lord of the Rings is exactly what Tolkien tells us it is, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. So how exactly is it fundamentally religious and Catholic? Let's begin our exploration of the deepest Catholic significance of the book by starting at the very beginning of the story with the creation of Middle-earth itself. There was Eru, the One, who in Arda is called Iluvata, and he made first the Aino, the Holy Ones, that were the offspring of his thought, and they were with him before aught else was made. In the beginning there was the one God, Iluvata, the All-Father, or Father of All, and he first made the Ionur, the Holy Ones, or Angels. It can be seen that Tolkien is at great pains from the beginning to make his subcreated world conform with the real created world conforming his creation story to that in Genesis. Middle-earth has only one God. It is a monotheistic cosmos, not a polytheistic cosmos like that of the pagans, 
Still less is it an atheistic cosmos, like that of the modern day materialists. It is also a fallen cosmos, due to the rebellion of Satan, whom the elves call Melkor or Morgoth. The parallels with Christianity are unmistakable. Melkor is described by Tolkien as the greatest of the Ionu, as Lucifer was the greatest of the angels. Like Lucifer, Melkor is the embodiment and the ultimate source of the sin of pride, intent on corrupting mankind for his own purposes. When God proclaims a great music, Melkor refuses to play in harmony with the rest of the angelic beings and disharmony enters the cosmos. God's response is replete with the deepest mystical theology as he declares to Melkor or Satan that his evil is not only ultimately doomed to failure but that God will bring great goodness out of the very evil itself beyond Satan's wildest imaginings. These are God's words to Satan Melkor after Satan has introduced his discordant themes into the harmony of the great music of creation. No theme may be played that hath not its uttermost source in me. He that attempteth this shall prove but mine instrument and the devising of things more wonderful, which he himself hath not imagined. The parallels with Genesis become even more obvious when Tolkien describes the war between Melkor and Manwe, the latter of whom is clearly cast in the role of the Archangel Michael. When therefore earth was yet young and full of flame, Melkor coveted it, and he said to the other valour, This shall be my own kingdom, and I name it unto myself. But Manwe, was the brother of Melkor in the mind of Iluvata, and he was the chief instrument of the second theme that Iluvata raised up against the discord of Melkor. And Manwe said unto Melkor, This kingdom thou shalt not take for thine own wrongfully, for many others have laboured here no less than thou. And there was strife between Melkor and the other valour. The fact that Tolkien's Melkor is merely another name for Satan is made even more manifest when Tolkien connects them linguistically. Tolkien explains that the name Melkor means he who arises in might. But that name he has forfeited, and the Noldor, who among the elves suffered most from his malice, will not utter it, and they name him Morgoth, the dark enemy of the world. Similarly, Lucifer, brightest of the angels, means light bearer, whereas Satan, like Morgoth, means enemy. Morgoth means enemy, Satan means enemy. Therefore, Morgoth means Satan. They are simply different words for the same thing. Morgoth is Satan. Tolkien's intention, both as a Christian and as a philologist, in identifying Melkor with Lucifer is beyond question. Even the way that Tolkien describes the fall of Melkor or Satan in the Silmarillion is similar to the way that Satan's fall is described in the book of Isaiah. First, the book of Isaiah. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And this is how Tolkien describes the same fall. From splendor he fell through arrogance to contempt for all things save himself, a spirit wasteful and pitiless. Understanding, he turned to subtlety in perverting to his own will 
all that he could use until he became a liar without shame. He began with the desire of light, but when he could not possess it for himself alone, he descended through fire and wrath into great burning, down into darkness. And darkness he used most in his evil works upon Arda, and filled it with fear for all living things. As well as the scriptural influence, the other overriding influence is a profoundly orthodox understanding of Augustinian theology. Evil, as symbolized by darkness, has no value of its own, but is only a negation of that which is good, as symbolized by light. This understanding of the parasitic nature of evil permeates Tolkien's work and is especially true of the depiction of evil in The Lord of the Rings. Shortly after Tolkien describes the fall of Satan on Melkor in the Silmarillion, he introduces Sauron, the Dark Lord in The Lord of the Rings. He is described as the greatest of Melkor's servants. In other words, Sauron, the evil power in The Lord of the Rings, is revealed to us as the greatest of Satan's servants. But in after years he rose like a shadow of Morgoth and a ghost of his malice and walked behind him on the same ruinous path down into the void. It is abundantly clear, therefore, that the evil powers in the Lord of the Rings are specified as servants of Satan, rendering impossible, or at least implausible, anything but a theistic interpretation of the book. And the symbolic connection of the evil characters with Satan is made even more apparent in the way that Tolkien uses linguistic connections to suggest the satanic dimension. Tolkien, remember, was a linguist, a professor of philology at Oxford University, and he often employs linguistic clues to his deepest meaning. Take, for instance, the name of Sauron, the Dark Lord of the Lord of the Rings. The letters S-A-U-R come from the Greek word Sauros, meaning lizard or dragon. And we know, of course, that in medieval typology and in Christian iconography down the ages, the lizard or dragon or serpent is a symbol of Satan. Clearly, Tolkien wants us to see Sauron as satanic. Similarly, one does not have to be an expert in anagrams to see that Saruman includes the same four letters, S-A-U-R, in a slightly rearranged order. Saruman, like Sauron, is satanic. And what about worm tongue? Well, the old English word for dragon or serpent was veum, spelled W-Y-R-M, or worm. Worm tongue means serpent tongue or dragon tongue, or by extension, devil tongue. As if this isn't obvious enough, Tolkien makes the satanic connection even more clear in the way that Gandalf calls Wormtongue a snake, commanding him to get down on his belly in words that echo God's punishment of Satan. Down, snake, down on your belly. See, Theoden, here is a snake. As if to emphasize Wormtongue's serpentine character, Tolkien describes Wormtongue's reaction. He bared his teeth, and then with a hissing breath, he spat before the king's feet. So much for the role of satanic evil in The Lord of the Rings, but now it's time to reveal the secret that unlocks the fundamentally and religious dimension of the whole work. The fact is that Tolkien hides a key within the story, a key that, once discovered, allows us to unlock the deepest Christian theology at the heart of the drama. What is the key? It's to be found in the date on which Tolkien tells us that the ring is destroyed or unmade. That date is March the 25th, 
a date that every Catholic knows is perhaps the most significant and important date on the whole Christian calendar. March the 25th is the Feast of the Annunciation, the date on which the Archangel Gabriel appears to the Blessed Virgin. And more important, it is the date on which Jesus is conceived in his mother's womb. It is the date on which the Word is made flesh, the date on which God becomes man. It is a more important date than Christmas, because life begins at conception, not at birth. God did not become man at Christmas, but at the Annunciation. The Incarnation happens at the Annunciation. It happens on March the 25th, the date on which the ring is destroyed. And that's not all. Many medievals believe that the crucifixion also happened on March the 25th. Of course, we celebrate Good Friday as a movable feast. It is celebrated on a different day each year. But the crucifixion, as an historical event, happened once on a particular day in history. That day, so the medievals believed, was March the 25th, thus connecting Christ's death to his incarnation. And what do these two events signify, taken together with the resurrection? They signify man's redemption from original sin. And what is original sin? It is the one sin to rule them all, and in the darkness bind them. Just as the one ring is the one ring to rule them all, and in the darkness bind them. The one ring is the same as the one sin, and they are both destroyed, or unmade, on the same day, March the 25th. This is no coincidence, but is the very key that unlocks the deep theology and deepest meaning of the Lord of the Rings. The One Ring is nothing less than a symbol of original sin itself, and by extension, a symbol of actual individual sin also. So how does this sin manifest itself in the story? Well, what happens when you put the ring on? It's a good question and a crucial one. Many of you might be thinking that the wearer of the ring becomes invisible when he puts the ring on. But does he? Think about it a bit more carefully. What actually happens is that the wearer of the ring becomes invisible in the good world that God made, but becomes more visible to the eye of Sauron, to the eye of Satan. Suddenly, he was aware of the eye. There was an eye in the dark tower that did not sleep. He knew that it had become aware of his gaze. A fierce, eager will was there. It leaped towards him, almost like a finger he felt it searching for him. Very soon it would nail him down, know just exactly where he was. Ammon Law it touched. It glanced upon Toll Brandir. He threw himself from the seat, crouching, covering his head with his grey hood. He heard himself crying out, Never! Never! Or was it... Verily... I come to you. He could not tell. Then, as a flash from some other point of power, there came to his mind another thought. Take it off, fool. Take it off. Take off the ring. The two powers strove in him for a moment perfectly balanced between the piercing points, he writhed, tormented. Suddenly, he was aware of himself again. Frodo, neither the voice nor the eye, and free to choose. and with one instant remaining in which to do so, he took the ring. 
from off his finger. In other words, when we put the ring on, when we put sin on, we excommunicate ourselves from God's world, the world of goodness, and enter into Satan's world. Will we listen to the voice, or will we succumb to the eye of Sauron? Will we heed the voice of conscience, or will we choose the evil? It is a crucial question, a matter of eternal life and death. If we choose the evil and allow the sin to become habit-forming, we become addicted to it. It becomes our precious. Eventually, we become less and less like the good person, or good hobbit, that we were meant to be, and become more and more like a hideous and pathetic parody of who we were meant to be. We cease to be a man or a hobbit, and we turn more and more into a golem. And here is one of the key morals of the Lord of the Rings, that the thing possessed possesses the possessor. Or, as Christ told us in the Gospel, that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. But what is the alternative? What must we do to avoid becoming addicted to our sin, or addicted to the ring? My only, my love, my precious. As Christians, and remember always that Tolkien was a lifelong practicing Catholic, we know that we must take up our cross and follow in the footsteps of Christ. What does Frodo do? He takes up his cross and follows in the footsteps of Christ. But how? There's no cross in the Lord of the Rings, nor is there any mention of Christ. Remember that we must think typologically if we understand the deepest elements in Tolkien's myth. Remember his words to C.S. Lewis, that all the great stories reflect the true story of Christianity. How then does Tolkien's story reflect the true story? Specifically, how does the carrying of the ring resemble the carrying of the cross? What is the cross of Christ? It is a symbol of sin. It is the sin of the world that Christ carries on his back on the Via Dolorosa, the way of sorrows, to Golgotha, the mountain on which he will be crucified. We have already seen that the ring is a symbol of sin, so it is easy to see that the carrying of the ring is symbolically synonymous with the carrying of the cross. Frodo carries his cross through Mordor, which is clearly rooted linguistically in the Latin word mors or mortis, meaning death, to Mount Doom, the mountain of doom, clearly an echo of Golgotha itself. So Frodo and his loyal companion Samwise Gamgee walk through the Valley of Death to Mount Doom, carrying the cross in mythological imitation of Christ himself. And, as we have seen, the climax on Mount Doom is united with Christ's crucifixion on Golgotha through the key date of March the 25th. And there is another tantalising parallel between Frodo's journey and the journey of every Catholic in imitation of Christ. During their trek through the sinful valley of Mordor, Frodo and Sam have nothing to eat, nothing to sustain them, except lembas, the elvish waybread. It seems to have magical or even miraculous nutritional powers. But what exactly is it? Literally, it is simply special bread made by elves to help those on a journey. But symbolically, its deepest significance is revealed by what lembas actually means in Elvish. Lembas means life bread, or the bread of life, a clear symbolic connection with the Blessed Sacrament itself. On their journey through the Vale of Tears, the Valley of Death, carrying their cross in imitation of Christ, 
Frodo and Sam are sustained on their journey by the bread of life. Once again, we see the journey of the hobbits as images of the true Christian's pilgrimage through life. But what about the climax on Mount Doom itself? Why is it that Frodo fails at the very last moment in his quest to destroy the ring? I have come, but I do not choose now to do what I came to do. I will not do this deed. The ring is mine. Why does Frodo fail? Isn't there something anticlimactic about his failure? I know that when I first read The Lord of the Rings, I was annoyed at this unexpected twist in the plot. Frodo had come so far, he had sacrificed so much, and then when all he had to do was throw the ring into the abyss, he couldn't do it. He had done the hard part, he had faced many deadly perils, many temptations, the strain of sheer exhaustion, and now at the last he fails miserably, snatching defeat from the very jaws of victory. I was angry with Tolkien. How dare he take away Frodo's moment of glory? We don't want our heroes to fail. We want them to succeed. I felt cheated. But on subsequent readings of the book, it became clear that this particular scene was Tolkien's masterstroke. It is perhaps the most important twist in the whole plot. The fact is that we cannot overthrow sin by our own efforts alone. We cannot carry our cross on our own. We need help. To be precise, we need the help of God himself. We need his grace if we are to overcome sin. We can't do it ourselves. As such, Gollum becomes a paradoxical symbol of grace itself. God's miraculous intervention to bring good out of evil. Do you remember Gandalf's words? Even Gollum may have something yet to do? But for him, Sam, I could not have destroyed the ring. The quest would have been in vain even at the bitter end. So let us forgive him. For the quest is achieved and now all is over. I am glad you are here with me. Here at the end of all things, Sam. But for Gollum, the quest would have failed. And Gollum is only there at the end because Bilbo, Frodo and Sam had each, on separate occasions, spared him his life when they were themselves tempted to kill him. If any of them had succumbed to the temptation to slay their enemy, the quest would have failed. The ring or sin would have defeated them. The three hobbits had learned the hardest lesson of all, that it was not enough to love our neighbours. We had to love our enemies also. If the hobbits had failed in obeying this toughest of Christ's commandments, the ring would have triumphed. Sin would have triumphed. But because they were faithful in keeping this commandment, Gollum was still around as the agent of grace that brought about the destruction of the ring. As if this were not enough to prove Tolkien's words that the Lord of the Rings is a fundamentally religious and Catholic work, there is so much more in the story that indicates its profoundly Christian meaning. We have no time in such a short discussion to study the death resurrection and transfiguration of Gandalf, or the Christological significance of the kingship of Aragorn, or the way in which the elves illustrate a Christian understanding of death and a Christian understanding of the difference between time and eternity, or the way in which Boromir, Faramir and Gollum, each in different ways, illustrate the consequences of human choices or the way in which Treebeard and the Ents offer a profound insight into the nature of tradition in both an ecclesiological and etymological sense. There is so much more that we could say, but so little time in which to say it. Perhaps we will return with further programmes on this most fundamentally Catholic of works. For now, 
I'd like to return to Tolkien himself and his own exposition of the meaning of life. In 1969, when Tolkien was 77 years old and living in sedate retirement in Bournemouth on England's south coast, he received a letter from a young girl who was working on a school project asking him, what is the purpose of life? Tolkien's reply exhibits his own profoundly mystical Catholic faith. It may be said that the chief purpose of life for any one of us is to increase, according to our capacity, our knowledge of God by all the means we have and to be moved by it to praise and thanks. To do, as we say in the Gloria in Excelsis, laudamus te, benedicamus te, adoramus te, glorificamus te, gratias agimus tibi, propter maniam gloriam tuam. We praise you, we call you holy, we worship you, we proclaim your glory. We thank you for the greatness of your splendor, and in moments of exaltation, we may call on all created things to join us in our chorus, speaking on their behalf, as is done in Psalm 148 and in the song of the three children in Daniel 2. Praise the Lord, all mountains and hills, all orchards and forests, all things that creep and birds on the wing. It is almost time to end our brief exploration of the Catholicism of the Lord of the Rings. But we still have time for a practical and cautionary lesson that the book teaches us. In the story, the Palantiri, the Seeing Stones, are used by Sauron to feed propaganda to the free peoples of Middle-earth. In particular, Denethor, the steward of Minas Tirith, becomes addicted to looking into the Palantir to discover what the enemy is up to. What he doesn't realise is that the Seeing Stone is actually controlled by the enemy, by Sauron, and that he only sees in the stone what Sauron wants him to see. It is not that the Palantir is showing complete lies, but it is only showing one side of the story. Denethor sees in the Palantir how invincible is the enemy's might, and he becomes convinced that Sauron, or Satan, is bound to win the coming war and will overthrow Denethor's own people and all the peoples of Middle-earth. In despair, believing that resistance to Satan or Sauron is pointless and futile, he commits suicide and, in so doing, almost brings ruin upon his own people. Bearing this in mind, it is interesting that Palantir, in Elvish, means far-seer, which in German, Fernsehen, means television. And indeed, the English word television also means far-seer or far-seeing, being a combination of tele, which is Greek for far, and vision, from the Latin video, to see. It seems that Tolkien is warning us that if we watch too much television, we will commit suicide. Dear viewer, heed Tolkien's words of warning and avoid the temptation to spend more time with your TV, PC, iPod, Xbox, or any other form of virtual reality. Keep your feet on the ground, your heart in heaven, and your mind on reality. Having ended on a somewhat whimsical, if nonetheless serious note, I'd like to leave the last word to Tolkien himself. Thanks for joining us on our journey in the quest for the Catholicism of the Lord of the Rings. Here's Tolkien on the beauty of the Blessed Sacrament. Out of the darkness of my life, so much frustrated, I put before you the one great thing to love on earth, the Blessed Sacrament. In it you will find romance, glory, honour, fidelity, and the true path of all your loves on earth, and more than that, death. By the divine paradox, that which ends life and demands the surrender of all, and by the taste or foretaste of which alone, can all that you desire in your earthly relationships, love, faithfulness, joy, be maintained, or 
take on the complexion of reality, of eternal endurance, which the heart of every man desires. Thank you.